Craig Glenchad, thank you so much for coming on Trapes and Global on Wheels to participate in our part- podcast. So for listeners who don't know him, Craig is a, a fellow Olympian and Paralympian. Um, uh, he was born with a birth defect called proximal femoral focal deficiency, which I've never even heard of, so I'll ask him to elaborate on that uh, later on. Um he became a world-class champion in wheelchair racing and setting 21 world records and earning eight world champion titles. He was born with the desire to compete and to get the most out of every experience. His athletic accomplishments and winning attitude landed him a full Nike sponsorship that lasted him eight years, and today he coaches others to be their best. Welcome, Craig Hi, thank you, Ming. This is great to be here. Great, it's so fun to watch you all those years ago, starting out with your racing and stuff, and now to see you, you doing podcasts and all this fun stuff. Yeah. So as I, thank you, as I alluded to earlier, um, tell me about what proximal femoral focal deficiency is. Yeah. So uh, proximal, um, uh, the the it's basically. Uh, femoral, the F in there, is my femurs um, are really sh- um, short. So if you if you were to look at a normal person's leg, they would have their hip, then they would have their femur bone, and then it would end at their knee, and then you have the bottom, you know, your tibia and fibula that go down to your foot. And and so for me, I have my hip, and then I have my femurs about two inches long. And then I have my knee. So it's almost like my hip and my knee are really, really close together. And then I don't have a fibula. I just have the main big bone in the in your bottom of your leg, the, the tibia. And so um, uh, so I'm not I'm not paralyzed. Um, and, and so, you know, all my plumbing and stuff works and and but and I can walk on my legs. Um, to some degree, but because there's a deficiency in the femur, the the hip joints, um, it's harder for me to stand. Um, so I use a wheelchair um, for convenience and for it's just easier and it's it's more efficient for me. I, I can do more things, and so um, but I can get out and crawl around, sort of sort of like a monkey, I guess, like a an ape, I guess maybe. <laughs> and so I, I can crawl around pretty easily and. and get up and down you know I have a two-story home and so you know we can get around and and all that so Mm -hmm. how do you get around in your two-story home well um we I mean I use my wheelchair when I'm on the bottom level and when I go upstairs I just get out and I just kind of crawl up I just crawl up the stairs you know I use I'm on all fours Mm -hmm. you know it's it's sort of like if you if if a normal normal built person would be walking on their hands and their knees. It's kind of similar. I would say that would look really, really similar to what it would look like. Although I just don't have the lower end of the leg sticking out the back. You know, my feet. It's just my hands and my feet that touch the ground. Mm, easier. Yeah. What kind of wheelchair do you use, and what kind of wheelchair malfunctions are you prone to with your, with your chairs over the years? Yeah. Well, I, for the, the everyday chairs, so I have, I I do hand cycling. I do used to do quite a bit of wheelchair racing, so those are two different types of uh, equipment. And then you know your everyday wheelchair, and so I think you're primarily thinking about everyday wheelchairs. Um, I started using a tie light chair probably 15, 18 years ago. It's been quite a while, and um, so I've always had not always, but for the last many many years. Um, I've, I've ridden a tie light and of course, because it's made out of titanium and, and, um, it's really high quality. Um, it, it works, it works really good, very durable. Um, and the, the ride is very comfortable for me. The, the main pieces on a wheelchair that I would have challenges with is just the wear and tear on the tires. You know, your tires, I, I like to go with the hard rubber tires rather mm-hmm. than the ones with air in them because mm-hmm. uh, getting a flat is, is a drag when you're, you know, if you are traveling and you get a flat tire, it's it's really, um, it's really disabling, I should say. And so I've run, 
the hard rubber tires for a long time and so you never get any flats and, and it, the chair just kind of it just gets out of the way unless unless you get where you need to go the uh, as far as other things that i would say it's making sure you have a really good cushion even though i have well especially i have um the benefit of having full sensation so if i'm sitting down too long uh, it will um my butt will let me know, hey, you're sitting down on, on – you're sitting down too long or if you're sitting on something hard. And so um, – but I still have to be very careful with um, with pressure sores and not sitting down on hard things too much, you know. Um, and so as I get older, um, uh, that's more and more of a concern for me. And so um, I use a Rojo cushion and um, they seem to work. Um, pretty well. Uh, although recently I was down in, um, I was in St. Louis actually for a health coaching. I'm a health coach and I have my own health coach practice. And I was at a, uh, a seminar training leadership seminar and I got a hole in my Rojo cushion. And so it kept deflating. Oh gosh. And, um, and it was like the hole was really big. And so I had like 15, bike patches on there and it still was deflating and and uh they were great they they warrantied it fine and, and sent me a new one but um anything with air in it can be a can be a problem obviously mm-hmm, mm-hmm. oh gosh so next we turn to fitness so why do you think it's especially crucial for wheelchair users to stay fit well i think it's uh, i don't well i guess it's probably good for both. Um, I, I coach a lot of chair wheelchair users now. Um, I've been, I've been having some great, great connections with many of former racers. And one of the biggest things for being in a chair, it, it, it affects everybody. It just affects people in chairs differently because somebody that stands up and walks around doesn't really transfer from one place to the other. They would just stand up and walk over. Right. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're in a wheelchair, you don't stand up. So you transfer from your chair to a couch or your chair to your car. And so when you're fit, um, one of the biggest, uh, benefits is mobility. Um, getting from the floor to your chair. If you are at a healthy weight, you can transfer and you're just more independent. Um, and I mean, it's the same thing for people that walk around as well. It just is, it just affects us in a little bit different ways. And most of the people in that that I know that use a wheelchair, well, everybody in life wants to be as independent as possible, be able to do as much as they can because the things that you can't do that someone has to do for you, you know, there's an added burden on it. And obviously if you're always waiting for somebody to do something for you, then, um, then you're, you have to wait. And so you want to be as independent as possible and being fit as a wheelchair user, um, allows you to be more independent and better transfers and, you know, taking care of your skin, um, especially on your, you know, your behind, you know, taking care of your legs, making sure you take, you know, your, any type of wound that you might have heals properly. And, um, all those things are just critical. Oddly enough. Um, I mean, I work with so many people that are working on their health. They're pretty unhealthy diabetes, um, people with cardiovascular problems, people with, um, uh, blood pressure, people with, um, you know, chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and, and, cholesterol problems, just so many different issues. And, um, uh, for someone in a wheelchair, the thing that will take you out quicker than all of that is a pressure sore. Hmm. Like it's just, it's such a, it's so important to have a good cushion and to take care of your butt. And, um, and if you take care of your butt, your butt will take care of you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so how can wheelchair users stay fit? So you just say you're a health coach, right? So mm-hmm. if this is right up your alley. What kind of yeah. exercises or recreational activities can they get involved in? Yeah. Well, and oddly enough, fitness 
there's um, well fitness would be more in in line with activity being healthy has is a combination of movement and um it's the body moving the body it's the ways that you think and it's the choices you make food wise and so it's a combination of those things and so um the things that i would say you know um is find uh find something that you're interested in like if if you like if you like mechanical types of things then um you know, wheelchair racing or um, hand cycling might be more up your alley. If you if you like things that are more um, that have like a lot of skill and coordination, or or where you get to work with a team, then you might want to do a team sport. Um, you know, and they've obviously basketball is a, is a simple one. They've got uh, rugby. Uh, for some, um, they've got uh, sled hockey, you know, things where you're actually having to work as a, as a team. If you like, if you like being around or on doing team sports, um, I've never really done a ton of team sports. So I've always done the wheelchair racing marathons and track, and then the, um, hand cycling, um, you know, it's things like that have been my forte, um, you know, I do some scuba diving and I do some, you know, I do, I'll do pretty much anything for recreation, but right now I'm primarily focusing on hand cycling. It depends on what someone's interest is, um, to start off with. If, if you, you know, you, you, I'm one of my, there's four main components that I talk with people about for, um, long-term health and one of them is called community and it, community if you break down the commu- uh, the one word community into two words it would be common unity and so you want to find people that are that have similar passions in life and then do do those things with those people so so you have to think about what kinds of things interest you and sometimes that's really hard if you pretty much just sort of show up and just kind of get through the day and a lot of times with the clients that I work with they actually don't really take a lot of time to think about what they want and they don't take a lot of time to dream about if if they could do something um, that they're not currently doing that would be fun or challenging usually those go together what would that look like and so you got to think about, well, someone maybe they would like to go, um, let's say that they used to ride mountain bikes, then they got um, injured and paralyzed. Well, they have off-road hand cycles that you can go mountain biking again on a hand cycle. Or, you know, if you, if you like to watch tennis, well, you can get involved in wheelchair tennis, you know, and go down to your, the local racket club and, and ask around and you'll figure that out. But it just depends. I, I, you have to start off with what is something that you like to do and then find a way to do that. Um, I like a lot of times people like to go hiking. We have lots of trails around here and they like to go backpacking or trail hiking. And so you can figure out some trails that are um, more wheelchair friendly and go get out in the wilderness and go go do some, you know, do some fun things and experience um you know, some new experiences and then find some people to go with you. Um, right now I'm actually at Portland international raceway and we are, um, we do every summer we do the, the PDX summer hand cycle series. And so for four months out of the year, every Tuesday night we come out to the track and we ride and they've got all these hand cycles. They got probably 40 hand cycles out here that are demos that are equipment. You can just show up and, you you get fitted into one and then you get to go ride out on, on the track you know and doesn't cost you anything you just got to show up and so you know ask around find who you know wherever you live um do like let's say you live in oregon well type in wheelchair sports oregon on google and see what comes up and start contacting those people and start asking them hey i want to get involved in something what do you what are your options and you'll find um, there's probably a whole lot more out there 
then um, then you realize. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's what that's what I did when I moved to New York City and just started contacting people. And once you get in contact with one, you usually will they will get you in contact with others. They usually will yeah. know of other organizations. So start well, with trying, one and trying to build community too. Exactly. They're trying to develop community with all the users and getting the people. And one thing that we all have, well, we have one thing in common: we're human beings. Okay, so we all have common unity that we're human and then many of us will use wheelchairs great so now we were a human and we use wheelchairs so we have two things that bond us together you know now if we like sports now we're human we're wheelchairs and sports right and so we find the things that will unite us and uh, there's plenty of them out there mm-hmm mm -hmm. Okay, so next we talk about the not so bright side of fitness. So a lot of wheelchair users encounter shoulder problems, elbow tendonitis, carpal tunnel, whatnot. Have you experienced these? And then if you have, how have you dealt with them? Yeah, so so you you know when it comes to um, shoulder injuries and different kind of injuries, uh, being in a wheelchair, your your biggest um, I think your biggest enemy if you will is being overweight and of course that's most americans struggle with being overweight and so um i work with a lot of people that are in chairs that some of them are quads or some of them are you know they can't even they can't even work out they can't even move their hands and well, i'm able to help them actually lose weight um and then it's easier for other people to, um, you know, you know, transfer them. But the biggest thing is getting down to a healthy weight is going to be massive benefits, not only on the inside of your body, but also on the outside of your body. Um, your transfers are going to be easier. Your freedom's going to be easier. It's going to have less pressure on your butt. Um, and there's so many things your body's going to heal quicker. There's so many things that are associated with, with our weights um, and basically putting just less wear and tear on our shoulders. Uh, for me, I've, I've been a massage therapist now since 1992, and so I've, uh, and I've been um, professional um, uh, wheelchair racer, professional athlete for since 1986. And so... I've been around the world of, you know, physical therapy and massage and training and all that for many years. And so when you, when you're injured, you can't perform well, um, in, in life or in, in competitions. And so I have had a lot of, and has paid a lot of attention to that. And so for, for me, um, uh, I haven't had any significant injuries in my racing career, um, from training or, you know, and, and I just, I rest well. I, my nutrition is, I pay a lot of attention to my nutrition and I try to train smart. Um, you know, my, my old coach that taught me many things, Kevin Hansen, and he just taught me how to really pay attention and be aware of what's going on inside your body. And, and so, um, he see he always told me there's a difference it, when you're when you're exercising or training and there's pain, there's two types of pain. One's discomfort and one's destructive. And he said, learn to know the difference. And if you're ever pushing into pain where something's it's it's hurting you, you need to stop. And so I've I've taken that um, concept and that principle and applied it my whole life. But I get lots of massage. I do ice. I spend a lot of um, time on nutrition and recovery and, you know, getting the right types of proteins, carbs and fats and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, now there was one time recently, uh, 2014, I was in the rock and roll marathon down in San Diego, California. And, um, I was a first time racer there, even though I'd been racing for so many years, it was the first time I had done that event. And at the three mile marker, they had a, a, a pretty nice downhill and then they had a, a two 90 degree corners and then the road got narrow after the second corner 
because they had a lane of traffic. And so I came down through that, not, not knowing the road was going to narrow and not knowing there would be cars on the course and, um, came around the corner and I, I couldn't make the corner. And, um, and so I hit the car and, um, I broke my whole shoulder and, and, um, had to have my rotator cuff, massive rotator cuff reconstruction and, and broke some ribs and, you know, it was pretty gnarly. And so from that accident, you know, I learned what it was like not to be able to use one of my arms for eight months. And, um, and that was, that was, uh, well, it was painful, but it was also, you know, you just have to have somebody there to kind of care for you, you know, 24 seven. And, um, and so having a shoulder injury for someone that's paralyzed, um, is would is even worse you know it's just you want to take care of your shoulders and you want to you want to keep them strong and keep your weight at a healthy weight and then you know just take care of them yeah you know, you're doing uh, silly can, things is not not smart with your shoulders yeah can you elaborate on taking care of your shoulders just a bit more yeah well you know there's some strength training you know keeping them strong uh um, I get regular massage, which gets all the, the toxins and stuff out. And if there's scar tissue built up, it kind of helps with scar tissue. Um, and, um, you know, not doing things, there's certain movements. Like a buddy of mine was at wheelchair sports camp, which is down in Minnesota. And I'm, I'm the director for the national wheelchair sports camp. And that's in, um, Rochester, Minnesota in June. And, um, my uh one of my buddies was getting from his wheelchair onto a horse and so he turned with his back to the horse and he reached up with his right arm put it on the saddle so his arm is extended backwards and it's up so the tendon in your shoulder is all the slack is taken out of it and then he put put um pressure on it because he was he was contracting the muscles to pull himself up on the horse and something snapped, you know, and so there's certain movements. Anytime you're reaching back and up, you got to be super careful because that's very, very dangerous for your shoulder. So you want to you want to learn how your shoulder works and learn how to um, not push it too far, um, you know, in a, in a bad, in a bad situation. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. So that's, that's, that's kind of the things that I'm talking about. Does that make sense? Is that is that? Yeah, 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 enough? that does. Thank, thanks. So next, we're going to move on to a fun section, hopefully, travel. Okay. Um, so where okay. all have you traveled to? And what are some of oh. the more wheelchair-accessible places out there? Yeah, I've traveled. Um, I've been traveling since 1986. Um, you know, I've been out of the country many, many, many times. Um, Australia, I've been to China, I've been to uh, Korea for the Olympics, Um I've been to Belgium and France and um, I've been to Africa, Zambia, um, um, Lusaka, a number of places in Zambia um, and of course all over the United States, many, you know, I don't know if every state, but many, 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 many states um, to race and a lot of that's been racing. Um, And, you know, when, when I travel, um, you know, the, the, I'm, I'm probably not a very good, um, disabled person. I was, cause I was born this way. Um, you know, I, I don't expect the world to be built for me and, um, you know, not everybody, not because I have a, quite a bit of, I've developed a lot of skills. I know how to hop a curb. So if I don't have a curb cut, I can pop a curb. You know, now there's some people that even if they had the skills, they don't have the, if they're a quad or a high level quad, it's just not possible. So, so I'm, you know, uh, I don't expect the world to be, to cater to me. There's certain things, there's everybody in the world has things that they can't do, that they're, that the world's not designed for everyone. And so I realized that that's the case and there's still plenty of things that I can do. And so I focus on the things that I can do and then I build as many, as much of my own skill sets to give me even more 
um, possibilities. Um, but it, you know, when you're traveling to a, a third world country, it's different than if you're traveling to a first world country. You know, going to Australia is not a problem for a wheelchair user. Going to Zambia is. It's different. You know, you got a lot less concrete a lot more dirt, you know, and things like that. So, um, um, it just depends kind of really where you're going. But for me, when I traveled, oftentimes I would travel with, um, uh, racing equipment. And so not only did I have my everyday chair, but I had my, some type of hand cycle or, or, or racing chair. And so there was a lot of gear, you know, that I took with me. Um, and so you always have to make accommodations for those kinds of things, but it kind of is just part of the sport, you know, part of that whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges you've encountered while traveling? Yeah. One of the, the first one that comes to my mind actually was when we were going to Australia, I think it was back in 2014, and we, the, our connecting flight was in China and actually it wasn't a problem actually with, with being in China. It was, I had a, a compressor for my pumping up my, my racing tires and, um, and they wouldn't, uh, because it had a battery in it, they wouldn't allow it to go on the plane with me and they didn't speak English. And so, um, that was one of the biggest challenges was just figuring out because I needed this air pump when I got to Australia to pump up my racing tires. Mm -hmm. And so that was a big challenge, but that, well, I guess probably if you don't have tires, you're not bringing an air pump with you. So you probably normal people, normal non wheelchair using people wouldn't have that issue. Um, but you know, there's a lot when you travel to other countries, you have to be prepared to do more transferring, you know, because not not there's not necessarily transportation with lifts on it and things like that. And so you might have to um, climb up a few stairs, you know, and just um, I would say my biggest advice for when you're traveling is taking care of your butt. Um, my buddy, an old racing buddy of mine, Scott Hollenbeck, whenever he travels, he brings three cushions. So he's got his cushion for his chair, he's got his cushion for the shower, and then he's got his transfer cushion. So he has a cushion that he pops out whenever he transfers down onto the ground. So he makes sure that his butt never touches the ground without there being a cushion between the floor and his butt. And, um, and he's, he's almost died from pressure sores. And so, um, so that's when you travel, just make sure you have good skin care and you take care of your butt when you're traveling because uh, you have more more transfers when you're traveling and all that. So in terms of travel, and you talked about, you know, the language barrier, which most everyone experience, and then you talk about the, the cushions and pressure sores. What, what would make uh, travel more accessible? to wheelchair users, what other changes could be made? Oh, well, anytime you have stairs, there, that adds a degree of difficulty that's, that increases exponentially. So, you know, having um, ramps is, is obviously much more accessible than stairs. If it's one stair, it's not too big a deal. If it's, um, it can be lots of stairs going down but lots of stairs going up is a problem. Um, but you know, most of the time it's, uh, it's probably stairs. Um, and then depending on the width of your chair, I run a pretty narrow chair and so it can get into just about through any doorway. But if you've got a chair, some of the chairs will turn better if they got, um, the, if the wheels have camber, which means the wheels at the bottom where they touch the ground are wider than where they are at the top. But when you have more camber, it makes, it, your chair wider, which means you can fit, you can't fit as many places. And so I run a, a tie light now with, I think two degrees camber or something like that. And so it's pretty narrow and it fits, it fits everywhere. So that's a plus. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess it's, I, I haven't really 
I just sort of take things as they come to me and I just experience travel for what it is. And uh, one of my life's mottos, um, a lot of times people will come to an obstacle. They, they have a goal that they want and then they come to an obstacle and the obstacle looks really big at first glance. And they say, uh, I can't. I can't fill in the blank. I can't get over that curb or I can't get beyond that doorway or I can't, you know, get past that thing. And um, my, uh, my little phrase that I use is let's just assume that I can. And if I could, what, what would be the first thing that I'd need to solve? Or another way of putting it is, how can I? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and so instead of instead of going through life with a series of I can'ts, what if you change those I can'ts to how can I's? Mm-hmm. No, and when you ask yourself that question, it changes everything, because your brain goes from a defeated state to a problem solving state, and you start. It's almost like a, um, it's almost like a puzzle that you're trying to put piece together to figure out how you can accomplish the thing you want. And so I've always done that in my life. And so when I travel, it's the same thing. If I want to get, go see something or do something or experience something, I, I rarely just say I can't. I figure out how can I, and then I, I, I start problem solving until I get it mm-hmm. or until I get to where I actually can't go any further. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you're right. When you ask a different question or think about things from a different angle, then um, your br- brain starts to go in that alternative direction Mm -hmm. so in terms of access to resources when traveling um say car rentals Mm -hmm. or anything like that um can those those things improve yeah for sure um you can buy a set of traveling hand controls and a lot of people actually just use the traveling the the scaled down hand controls in their everyday you know cars um oddly enough um, I use actually I'm in my car right now, which is kind of funny. But I actually just use um, some doweling and with Velcro on the ends, and so I use my feet to actually drive with, and so I just use these um, sticks that make it so I can reach the pedals. So when I travel, I just have a couple pieces of sticky back Velcro in my bag, and then I have my two sticks, and I just. I get to the car rental place and I just, I usually take off the little rubber, um, the, the rubber covering that's on the pedal. And then I stick a piece of Velcro right on the metal Mm -hmm. and then I put my stick right on it. And then I just drive with my legs just like I do at home. So renting a car for me is, is, um, not, not too much more work. I know with, um, some car rental places you can call a couple days in advance and order a car with hand controls and i've tried that before and and because i didn't really need it i just tried it when i got there it was the car wasn't ready and so i was just like never mind i have my own you know so it what i would do is if i was traveling is i would figure out um well i'm just I'm much more of a problem solving person. I look at life as a series of questions to be solved. And so, um, I bring my own hand controls. I don't, I don't worry about someone else accommodating me Mm -hmm. because a lot of times people go through life and they just have a lot of expectations that the world's just going to show up ready to go for them. And I think, I don't know if everything was solved for me, life would be boring. You know, you just show up and like, there's just no more challenges in life. And then life just gets boring. So I I like challenges. I I like solving puzzles and problems. And I like figuring out ways to, to, to get something done. I've got a tandem hand cycle. So my wife and I wanted to ride bikes together. And so, um, I thought it'd be cool to ride a tandem because I'm quite a bit faster than she is, but on a tandem, you stay together. Right. And so I, I worked on this project for about four years and then I made a a hand cycle that has a, the back person has a hand crank on it. And so we ride that thing all over the place, you know, and 
and it wasn't like I could go to the store and just buy one. I had to figure it out. But that, there was something satisfying about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Well, maybe you can multiply that so that others can use it as well. Yeah, that would be fun. Yeah. Um, so the last question on travel, what are the advantages of traveling in a wheelchair? Speaking of putting a positive spin. Yeah, advantages are you get to load first. You know, that's kind of fun. Um, you, you know, uh, sometimes you, they'll upgrade you, but but uh, not as much. It used to upgrade you all the time. That was pretty great, but it doesn't happen. So some of the advantages with traveling um, in a wheelchair is you get to lo load the, the plane first. That's kind of fun. Um, but you, when you get off, you're last. So I guess it's it, it, it neutralizes it there. Um, but I don't know. I, I don't know that traveling in a wheelchair is anything great or not great. Um, I just like traveling because you get to meet people, and I just love meeting people and and learning about their stories. And there's always interesting people in the airports when traveling, and you get to find out where they're going and why they're going. And it's I just always find that fascinating. But that has nothing to do with the fact that in your wheelchair. Although actually, maybe something I take for granted because a lot of people, when you come up to somebody and you're in a wheelchair and you're very comfortable with yourself, then they become very comfortable with you, and you're very disarming. And so I can have conversations with people um, and build rapport very quickly. And so that's how I use my wheelchair as an asset rather than a, a, the, than a, a disadvantage. Hmm. And so and you got to use what you got to use what you have and then you build your skills for the things you don't have. And you can do a lot of stuff in this world. You know, I am definitely not a guy that's saying poor me, I'm in a wheelchair, I can't use my legs, you know, it's just, that's just not the case at all, and and I think it just depends really on how you want to look at your life, and there are so many more things that I can do than there are things that I can't do, and so I just focus on the things I can do. Sweet. So what are some effective ways that others can advocate for themselves better, thinking about yeah. the target audience in mind? Sure. I would always assume some people are doing the best they can. Here's a here's a story my wife told me. When I got, uh, I'd get to the airport and I would go to the baggage claim, and I wanted people, I wanted to be independent. So people would come up and try to help me with my bag, and I'd tell them I don't need any help. And um, I did that for for a while. My wife's known me for a long time. We've been married for 26 years, and we've been together as friends for 30, 38 years or something. It's a long time. Wow. And so um, so she said, when you're able to – I noticed – she goes, I noticed when you came out the door, you held the door for that lady. She goes, did that make you feel good? And I said, yeah. She goes, I also noticed that when you were unloading your bags – there were a couple of people that wanted to help you and you didn't let them. She goes, does it make you feel good when you're able to help somebody? And I said, yes. And she looked me in the eyes and she said, don't rob people of that experience. And I was like, Oh, you're so good for me. <laughs> right. Because Think about it. When, when, when you're able to help somebody, it, it makes you feel good. And if you're the one receiving the help, you just got to take your pride and you got to just put it over in the corner and let somebody help you because it makes them feel good. And, and plus it's, it's okay to have help. Mm -hmm. So when I'm traveling, I just try to make sure that I'm humble enough and that I let people help. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm pretty independent too, but, but, but give people an opportunity to, to feel like they contributed and like they helped you out. You know, and it doesn't diminish you at all to let someone help you. Mm -hmm. That's an ego um, thing. So speaking of that, that was a really great example about your wife just seeing a, a different perspective to to what you were used to seeing. Um, how how would you change or not change about how others have advocated for you growing up, whether that be your parents, your teachers, um, later on your wife, your friends? Yeah, I think that one of the ways we advocate um, our—it seems like our culture nowadays 
is trying to, um, I don't know, they try to focus on, it's very tribal. It's very, it's just weird. Our culture's gotten really twisted, very, very, um, I don't know, just weird. And so when, when someone, don't forget that um, hard things make us stronger. Every challenge that you have in your life is going to grow something in you. So do you want to grow or do you want do you want to shrink, right? And so when you're coming up to a challenge in your life and, and it's going to be hard, and so then you make a big fuss and complain about the hard thing, trying to make it easier for you, and then you end up making someone else's life harder. I just think that the, the reality is, is that when you look at your life and you go and attack hard things, they grow something inside of you and you become stronger. And so uh, look at your challenges as, as something that uh, – here, here's, here's a quote a, a buddy of mine, Dan Valentine, said. He goes, the hard things don't happen to you. The hard things happen for you. I, thought, mm. I just sit that, just let that simmer, and and let that take take place in your life. That the hard things happen to you because they grow so, uh, uh, something in your character. They grow something in your awareness of others. They grow something in your humility, or they grow something to make you stronger in a certain way. And it's good for us. Uh huh. Yeah. No, that's a very good point. So how does that relate to how others have advocated for you? Yeah. Well, I mean, others have advocated for me by giving me a chance. Well, coming out here, like, for example, the Portland International Raceway, I wanted to come out here and ride with the cyclists. So I did. So I came out and I started riding with the cyclists. And then the next year they said, I'm sorry, but um, your bike is different because you have three wheels your bike is different because you have three wheels and everybody else has two wheels and so um our rules are very specific and so um you're gonna have to figure something else out and then i was like okay well i still want to race but i can't race the bikes how can i so i had a conversation with them and they said well what if we started up a hand cycle series i said that sounds like a great idea and so they went and advocated for me and then worked with a couple other organizations and then I got involved as well. And then we were able to start up this hand cycle series, you know, um, mm -hmm. I don't know, seven years ago, six or seven years ago. Wow. And That's so, great. um, so now we advocate for other people by, by coming out here to the track and then, uh, providing a place for these, for people to, um, come and ride and build community and 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 uh, experience things they might not have ever done before what are some improvements that you would still like to see with the um disability community as far as social progress goes um yeah well it'd be you know, I, opportunities to, to be able to race more. You know, I, I like to enhance cycle racing, and so opportunities to race more, um, you know, have more events that, that um, have, have hand cycle divisions. You know, that's great. But that's pretty much like if if you have a desire to do that, I, there's a guy back in Wisconsin, and he didn't have a lot of ability to travel. travel. And so he went to the race director, and he said, can we, we start a hand cycle series? And, um, and instead of him coming to all of us, he started this really big racing series and all of us came to him. And so this year he had 50 guys that flew into Wisconsin to do racing with him, you know? And, and so it was really great that he, that he was able to figure out how to make it, um, you know, to overcome one of his obstacles mm -hmm. and, and provide a, a venue for people to come and, and compete at a high level. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so we come to our last question. Um, are you comfortable with being labeled disabled? And if 
if not, what other word would you use to um, contextualize, conceptualize individuals with disabilities? Yeah, it's, it's um, I mean, we all have things we can do and things we can't do. I, I mean, uh, it's curious when someone would call me disabled because I would say, how did you come to that conclusion? And it's probably just because I use a wheelchair. But, I mean, uh, there's a lot of people out there that have two working legs that are way more disabled than I am because they're 300 pounds, right, and, or whatever it might be. And so I'm not, I'm not so – I used to have, a, you know, I used to be more grumpy about the wording, and, and I am so anti-politically correct nowadays – that, um, you know, I, people, you know, I guess it's just human nature is to categorize people into groups. And so I'm, I'm a wheelchair user, right? Fine. But that's so, such a small portion. It's like, it's like, well, I'm a, I'm a Nike tennis shoe wearer. You know, why would you even categorize somebody as somebody that wears Nike tennis shoes? You know, you're just, you're a human being and you're, you're, um, you know, you're, maybe you're a tennis player or you're going you know, to, whatever it is, the thing that you do. Um, so I, I don't get, I don't get offended. Actually, here's another, here's another pretty strong, um, principle. It's the, um, uh, the concept of being unoffendable. And, um, this is where our culture is all twisted and out of shape is you can choose to be offensive to me, but that doesn't mean that I have to be offended. But in our culture nowadays, people think that if that they're just offended, they're looking for things to be offended at. And, and I don't live my life. My life is much, much happier and much more fulfilling living it this way than looking for things to be offended uh, about, you know? And so if somebody wants to call me disabled, great, but it's fine. What, whatever. It really doesn't make any difference. I'm not offended by that. And so, so I try to be as I'm trying to become unoffendable and that is what I have in my control. 100%. Even if you're quite offensive to me, I think it's really wonderful that you're always able to, take matters into your own control. But what if you didn't have to do that all the time with everything? Because at times, even for myself, I feel like that's kind of exhausting. And to be honest, I'm not a huge fan of the word disabled either. Mm -hmm. um, so if you could choose any other word to describe this group of people, what would you use? Yeah, you know, I, I, um, I just spend very little time. I don't even really see the wheelchairs much anymore, but I'm a, I'm a wheelchair user. I would say that's, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. I do use a wheelchair. I'm not disabled. I mean, there's certain things I can't do, I guess, but, but what um, does it mean? I guess, what does it mean to you? Like when people say you're disabled, what? well, disabled means not able. And there, yeah, I'm not able to speak French. I'm disabled. I can't speak any language except English. So I'm disabled lingually, right? Um, I, um, I mean, there's plenty of things that that I'm not able to do. To me, call me whatever you think, but but if you call me Craig, I'll probably answer. <laughs> Sounds good, Craig. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Craig, for participating in the podcast. Um, we've really appreciated your insights. You betcha. And if people want to find more information on how to get a hold of me, you can go to craveoptimalhealth.com. Craveoptimalhealth.com. And you can get more information and connect with me. And I'd love to meet you. Thanks so much for your time in the interview, Ming. Thank you.